que, que, todos, que todos conocéis. Eh, y nos, es un profesor que viene de, de la Universidad de, de Gante, Sebastián Gante. Eh, oh, I'm afraid I cannot pronounce properly your surname. Oh, <laughs> oh, 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 oh. <laughs> Viene la Universidad de Gante, con la que tenemos un convenio de, de colaboración y nos complace muchísimo aprovechar justamente ese convenio para beneficiarnos de, de gente tan, tan interesante como lo, los profesores de Historia del Derecho de, de esa universidad. Y nos va a hablar de un tema que nos interesa muchísimo, el Liga Teórica, un tema además, eh, no solo desde la perspectiva del derecho, sino además en, precisamente en, en un sitio como en nuestro país, pues especialmente interesante este tema de construcciones nacionales. Así que, uh, thank you for accepting our invitation and listening to you. Thank you, Julia. Uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me here. Um, so, I am Sebastian. I will talk about my research, but actually about a new aspect of my research, something I started uh, the last few months. So these are just intermediate results and even just ideas more, um, of which I hope to find by the end of uh, this academic year. Um, the title of today is The Operators as Builders of Nations, the Case of Belgium During the Long 19th Century. Um, how did it start? First of all, I wrote since 2010 on a project, research project, on legal periodicals, law reviews, legal journals, where they were seen as mirrors of law. So basically, if you just take journals, you can reconstruct the law, or how law evolves. That's generally accepted by legal historians. So it is an ideal source for us to do research on. But it is also a neglected source sometimes, because most legal historians just use handbooks to find the scholarship or case law. Anyway, uh, the idea was to do it on Belgium, and the first hypothesis was that Belgium is completely embedded into a French tradition, which meant that each legal periodical is meant for legal practitioners, not for legal scholarship. Second hypothesis is that for Belgium, the linguistic issues, as always, are very important. But were they? That was my question. Because I wasn't completely convinced. Because, yes, you can publish on practical matters in law, but law is not as such a pure <coughs> theoretical science. You have to apply it to concrete cases. So basically, you are not, if you don't have enough with just a nice theory, the theory has to be applied. So that was my question, and that's where I find some answers. So I checked to other disciplines who studied journals or periodicals, and of course they agreed that they are mirrors. But they also said there are more than mirrors. They do more. They do more than just reflecting on what has passed by. Periodicals carry thus two elements in them. They have a passive one, so basically just the content, and if you look at it, and if you just put them all in one line, you can reconstruct an evolution or of a certain legal concept. But it also has an active one. You don't start a law periodical without a goal, without a name, without to try to implement something. So, and there I introduced a new term, I said it's a vector. It tries to implement new legal ideas, new legal ways of, new ways of legal thinking, and so on. One of the examples was the Revue de la Banque, or the Journal of the Bank, where you cannot find any case where a bank has lost. So basically, all journals have some certain political ideas. They have a certain policy, what to publish and what not to publish. So I introduced 
vector, a vector of law, and I put that on three levels. First of all, vector, in its most original meaning, is a carrier or something that carries an idea forward. So, the vector of law is a carrier of idea. The journal carries a legal idea to its readers. For, second of all, it has a direction and a magnitude. What do I mean by that? That's the vector for mathematics. What do I mean by that? The actors want to give the journal <coughs> a direction and a magnitude. They want to give it an impact on the legal readership, on the legal professionals, and so on. So, they are factors of law. And the third factor, or factor meaning I see, is that they relate to each other in a long chain. And this is the graph, and that's only the generalist law reviews, so generalist as in they work on all legal branches and all courses, so the higher court, the low court, it doesn't matter. And you can see from, 19, uh, from 1842 until today, we can basically reconstruct the whole legal history in Belgium, and you can see how things evolved deliberately sometimes by the Germans. So that's what I mean with factor. A nation, a young nation, needs national law. And my thesis was that, and I will <coughs> say today, that legal periodicals facilitate that. So they bring in national law. How do they do it? By bringing new content, but also by establishing a large network, because you have to see journals also like this, the Autosha networks, people are meeting there, they come together, you have editors, you have authors, you have readers, and so on. I took this one for the Belgian case, or for, uh, for Belgium, and I looked to the general periodicals, so, as I said, working on all legal branches and all courts, and the specialist periodicals which are just devoted to a legal branch, for instance, administrative law. Did I face any practical problems? Yes. First of all, there is no such thing in Belgium of an a complete list of all journals. So it might be that I forgot some. It might be that I didn't see. Second of all, some do, do exist for 100 years, so reading them all is practically impossible. So you have to use samples to check on how large is a certain aspect highlighted in the journal. I will do this today for the long 19th century, and that's a reference to Oldbaum, a famous historian, and I will distinguish two phases in Belgium. So the long 19th century is 1830 until 1914, so the independence of Belgium until the start of the First World War. And within, I will distinguish two phases. The first one is starting in 1830, and goes until 1881. Why 1881? Because in 1881, a new journal is established which will redefine the whole landscape of legal publishing in Belgium. You will get to that later on. Okay. Building a national identity. How do we do that? After we were annexed by the French, and then annexed by the Dutch in 1815, and after 15 years of Dutch ruling, in Brussels the riots started against the Dutch king. Belgium wanted to be independent. Why? Two reasons. First of all, the Dutch king introduced only Dutch as a public language, so French-speaking Belgians were not served in their own language. They got mad, especially because they were the elite. The elite spoke French in from, or in uh, the, the southern Netherlands at that time. Further, though, that elite was established by uh, industrials and so forth. 
So rich people spoke French. So they had the means, they had the ideas to tear it away from the Netherlands because the Dutch king imposed a lot of taxes on the southern part. And the southern part didn't want to pay for the northern part. So basically, the rhetoric is always the same everywhere. Phase one, construction. We have to construct a national identity. The government did, did this on a cultural level. Artists, historians, writers, they all were invited to write on the most important things we have known during our Belgian history. That was to show to the other European nations, like, look, we deserve to be independent. We have a rich history, we have our own culture, we have been forever independent, which was not the case because we had the Habsburg reign and so on and so on. But still, the, the huge, the, the most important stories in history popped up. Secondly, we wanted to find a legal identity. Our Article 139 of the 1831 Belgian Constitution said that the National Congress wanted to search for new legal codes. At that moment, we used Napoleonic codes. Because they were introduced by Napoleon. Why would you change the, the law system immediately? Just use Napoleonic codes first and then change everything slowly. That was the idea in 1831. For legal periodicals, not much change, actually. What did they just do? They continued existing. The only thing they did was adding <coughs> the Belgique or Belge to their title. For instance, Juste Prudence, 19e siècle de Belgique. Before 1830, it was just Juste Prudence, 19e siècle. So easy. So nothing really changed for legal periodicals as such. What was actually the case? The law journals got monopolized by a very small group of Brussels magistrates, four or five. They were responsible for every legal journal over there. They were just appointed in their, uh, in, uh, to, to seat as a judge. They were liberal of idea, and they were seen as true patriots. They had literally fought against the Dutch. So politically, they just got appointed before that. They were rewarded by being true patriots. They could monopolize the whole legal, political market. But they didn't add that much. They just brought case law and legislation. So no doctrine, no legal scholarship whatsoever. Just case law and legislation. Why? It's easy. They are judges. They have the cases. They just have to bring them together in one volume, and that's it. And let's finish the same thing. Copy the Moniteur Belgian, and you have it. So it's easy money. Another thing was that, I told that before, that the titles during the French and Dutch era just continue. So those titles, of course, things changed in editorial boards, but that wasn't that much of a difference. Sometimes we even had a French editor who just stayed in Brussels and stayed there forever, who became Belgian, but even a good Belgian. But this was criticized because we had so many um, journals with case law in it that it was impossible to find something back. There was no central thing. You really had to subscribe to nine journals to find one particular case. So what did they decide? In 1840, they decided to start the Pasiklisi Belge, which wrongly is seen as the oldest Belgian law journal. That's completely wrong. Some people say it's in 1814 it started already because it brings together the cases from 1814 to 1830. That's not the day it was issued. The day it was issued was 1840, and it still goes on until today. 
who was in charge? That was Theodore van Mons, who was one of those magistrates who was appointed by the new government. In 1822, he was just an attorney. In 1830, he was a judge because he was a true patriot. And another upside, he had he was experienced in legal publishing. Since 1822, he has been involved in several legal periods. So he knew exactly what to do, how to bring the journal to the market. This series continued on, now it's online, and brought together all case law, in theory at least. Because only two years later, there was this criticism uttered by some attorneys who said that there was a huge gap in the Pasi Belgium. Almost nothing from the lower courts was published. So there had to be done something to that. Therefore, in 1842, started La Belgique Judiciaire, the first generalist legal periodical in Belgium, who was founded by four Brussels attorneys not magistrates, they were out. For the first time, attorneys, lawyers, started a new journal. And not just any lawyers, no. The four of them had a liberal ideology, were true Belgian patriots, and might have had some anti-establishment idea. Let me explain that. You see Jules Martel, the first one. He was a journalist um, who wrote very critical articles on the new Belgian government. His brother was also a journalist who got even uh, oh, even sentenced uh, to prison before uh, because he was seen as someone liking the French government. And Bartels was also very fond of culture, of history, and so on. So he wasn't just an ordinary lawyer. He had a broad spectrum in ideas, in philosophy, and so on. He asked three colleagues of him to join him in this project in the Conseil Scientifique, so in the scientific board. So there was a scientific goal in this journal, and those three members were colleague attorneys, and they were all connected to the Liberal Party, which was at that time going up. It is also the moment where Belgium is finally recognized as a state. Between 1830 and 1839, Belgium was actually a sort of country that didn't exist in international law wasn't recognized by the huge powers. From then on, uh, in, in between 30 and 39, there was a unionist government, so there were no parties. That was not necessary because we had to stand firm to show to the people, or to Europe, that we were one nation. After 39, it changed. Catholic parties and liberal parties rose very swiftly. And in the Liberal Party, we see that a lot of lawyers are involved, and they bring, with La Belgique a new idea on Belgium. Because one of their huge questions was, Quel a été dans ce travail rapide de la situation, la part du droit et de la législation? What does it mean? They thought it was time for a genuine Belgian legal system. I told you about the Constitution in Belgium, Article 139. We were 12 years independent, and until then, nothing had changed. Just French law, what French law? We didn't apply anything, or we didn't change anything to Belgian law. La Belgique wanted to change that. They wanted to give incentives to the government, like, hey, you said in the Constitution, we will change that, we will 
do it for you and you just have to adopt the ideas. And what do they do? They bring huge articles on legal and institutional history. Why? To show again that Belgium has always been a rich region with very important institutions, especially during uh, the reign of Charles V. We were uh, with, with the court in Malin and so on. We had a huge international, a uh, um, huge institutional uh, history. Second point is the large attention for administrative law. Almost 20% of the doctrinal contributions were on administrative law. Again, this seems very logical because a young state needs more than a constitution, actually strong institutions, strong administration. So they wanted to bring a true Belgian administrative law, Belgian admin, uh, institutions, and so on. And they tried to bring new ideas of that. The spin-off of the journal was that La Belgique Communale, which was just uh, a spin-off by Jules Bartel, who also was the boss of the journal. It lasted only for a year because it was surrounded by uh, rumors of corruption and so on. It was bought by the Brussels civil, uh, civil administration, who subscribed for 200 subscriptions, which at that time was like complete idiocy. So the idea was that Bartels had just bribed the, the council, the city council, to get a lot of, a lot of subscriptions. There was a huge issue of that in the press, and La Belgique Communal disappeared after only two years. But the way it was set, and during the 1850s, one in the 1860s, we see the sudden rise of administrative law journals. Only that, nothing else. So no, nothing on notaries, nothing on uh, other legal branches, just administration. What is important, or is it even significant, is that the two first ones are coming from Liège, which is in the eastern part of Belgium. And it wanted to profile itself as another legal center in the country. And therefore, Bonjean, Rouès, who were heading four journals at that moment, because there were, there were other journals also uh, on the journal, uh, on the uh, tribunals of um, the first instance, for instance, just case law journals. Um, but those two people, with uh, cooperators, of course, established the Revue de l'Administration et des Droits Administratifs, which lasted very long time, until 1970, and La Memorial Belge, which disappeared at the end of 19, 19th century. But one of the most important ones in the first phase of our national store history is La Revue Communale, which now actually continues in a bilingual uh, journal. It is still La, La Revue Communale, but now they said for Gemeente student. Um, this was established in Brussels by a liberal civil servant. So no magistrate, no attorney, civil servant. He was heavily sponsored by the Ministry of Internal Affairs because he had the same ideas on how the state should be uh, made, how the state should be formed. It's also the moment where, for the first time, the, the law on the municipalities has been altered. So he brought ideas on, yes, we can make our municipalities more performant by introducing a new system in the elections and so on. Then we get to the second phase, which I call the consolidation phase. So you have constructed a legal identity, uh, a national identity, now you have to actually consolidate that. You have to make sure that that identity doesn't disappear and the appearance goes until the first world war. It starts with 
the issuing of the first edition of the Journal des Tribunaux, which has been founded by attorney in Brussels, Edmond Picard. He was renowned for being anti-establishment. If everybody said black, he would say white, just to annoy people. He was the first socialist senator, which was very strange for an attorney to be a socialist. And he is very well known for his anti-Semitism until today. And Montpicard has been, even in his days, very contested. But he assembled an editorial board with three colleagues. One thing that was important was they were all art lovers. So they had ideas on culture and they really thought that law and culture and people are the same. So they are mixed up. A nation does exist from culture and law, as the Greeks did, the Romans did, and so on. That was his idea. And he wanted to establish that. He wanted to involve the people, the Belgian population, into legal matters. Because at that time, nobody was really interested in what happened in the courtrooms. And Picard and his friends thought that's a dangerous situation because if people don't know what happens in the courtrooms, they won't apply law, thus we can go to chaos and so on. Another thing that he was very well aware of, that his fellow colleagues needed to be from different political ideologies. He was socialist, but the other ones was one liberal and a Catholic and then someone in between. Although the indecision was, of course, his, uh, uh, his call. What is important also is that the Journal de Tribunaux takes up a complete program of La Belgique Judiciaire. So it's not new. It doesn't bring anything new to it. Although it proclaims itself as being new. But what had happened in the 1880s, the first editorial report of La Belgique Judiciaire was literally died. <coughs> they were old and they died. And they didn't have a good successor, so it perished away. Journal de Tribunaux did one thing very clear, it had political statements. So it was more than just a legal periodical, it took political point of views. Especially on the Parti des Ouvriers, so on work, class issues, and on call. Because those two issues could bring Belgium to a large new level of, um, of international recognition. What do we see? We see some new journals on company law, which aren't that important. But more interesting are the industrial law journals. So those are raised after the, the uprise of working people in Belgium. Why? They were very bad treated in the mines and so on. They had a lot of working accidents and, and so on. So the people of Journal de because that's important, they were all involved in this, in, in these three. So you see, again, a small group connected to one journal trying to start a new one. This one only existed for two years, so that's in each other. But those two were very important because they laid the foundations for instance, well, for instance, on the act of uh, law, uh, of uh, work accidents, which has been treated by our colleague Bruno Lebans a lot. So they laid the foundations for that law by bringing in ideas from Germany, from France, and so on, and then they almost made some kind of pre actment and say, like, look, you can use this and this, and so on. Again, 
the next thing in the consolidation part is the colonial law issue. At the end of the 19th century, Belgium was rich in its industry. There were a lot of uh, industries. We were the, I think at that time, or before the First World War, Belgium was the fourth most important net nation in the world. We had the most uh, economy as well. And it had also a colony, Belgium Congo. And we see again, in all those journals, that the people from Journal de Tibnou are involved with them. with them. Why is that? They do believe that the colony, that it's a good thing that Belgium has one. And it's a good thing we bring civilization to those people in Congo. It's necessary because we will make sure that they will be more performant and thus make Belgium more performant, thus make Belgium more important as an international player. And you really read those ideas in those journals. They really do believe that there has to be some mix-up of Belgian law, international law, and traditional law over there. And they really try to construct a new legal system in Congo. And this goes on even after the Second World War. Another important thing in the end of the 19th century is the rise of the Flemish struggle, battle, as you call it. Because as you know, Belgium is a country hopelessly divided into uh, linguistic areas. And in the north, they were fed up with um, the French talking establishment. And lawyers took the lead here to try to implement a Flemish legal culture. It didn't mean that the legal culture had to differ from the French speaking part, but at least it had to be in Dutch, so people could understand. And what is very remarkable is that the first titles are on administrative law, not on any other thing, not on procedure, although there have been issues with procedural law, especially in penal cases, but nobody talks about that. First thing first, administrative law. The Flemish Institute for Flemish Administration is established by one person who was a governor, a Catholic governor in Belgium, who also had important part to play in uh, the introduction of Dutch in administrative legislation. He promoted those ideas already in the journal, and because he was also in the parliament, he could easily bring in those new ideas. Administrative law had to, has to be broad defined here, so it also uh, the, the church also on cemeteries, also on roads, and so on. So really everything in administrative law, education, and so on. That's what he is thinking. He died in 1909, which meant that the journal stopped. But there was some journal who wanted to take it over, the Tetzer for the maintenance student, or the journal for municipalities. And that one took over the legacy of the Adrian de Korsweiler. The second one started at the same moment of the first one, so also in 1889. Here we see again three editors, not one, three editors, two attorneys, one civil servant. And the most important one was the civil servants, not the attorneys. They were just being nice. They just were. Uh, giving more prestige to the journal instead of um, actually contributing to it. So de facto it was headed, headed by Karl Glantz, who was a civil servant in the Antwerp region. De facto it was his solo project. And he had only one goal, in Flanders, Flemish. 
That was it. What does it mean? In the northern part of Belgium, people need to be addressed in their own language because the normal people weren't able to speak French. So he wanted to give something to the people to introduce them with administrative law to show them their rights when they got uh, something to do with municipalities and so on. To make things even more comprehensible for the people, but also for attorneys, was that he contributed on legal language. So and literally, he translated words in lists from French to Dutch. And he said, yes, we have to do, use this word in this kind of sense, and so on. So he really wanted to emancipate Flemish lawyers, Flemish people, into their own language. Really by giving them the tools to do that. Giving something in practical. But the most important one was the Rechtskundigkeitsrecht for Vlaams Balde, which if you just look at the title, just one word changed. This was issued after huge legal reforms in, at the end of the 19th century, where procedure in penal law had to be done in Flemish for Flemish people. It was headed officially by influential lawyers, attorneys, who were also connected to the Flemish movements. But again, they were just there for prestige. They didn't contribute anything in the whole journal. It was again Karel Brandt who was boss of that journal. He asked those attorneys, like, we need people to give the journal some body. Why? Why would you just join? Do you believe in the Flemish cause? Yes. Okay, just join. They didn't have to do anything. They just had to bring in prestige. Again, we see contributions on legal language, but there's now every branch in the law has been used or has been taken into account. In a way, this journal uh, reacts to the French journal de tribunal. But it's not the whole picture, because this is a monthly, where the journal Tribunal was a weekly. What does it mean that it could never have the same impact as the journal Tribunal? Because the attorneys read more journal Tribunal each week were willing to adopt their ideas. They had to learn. They had to know French. They had to learn French, and. Also very important, before 1935, a judge could still decide, even in Flanders, to say, you will speak in French to me. So that's also an important issue that will be not discussed here. Um, but until 1935, there was no such thing as a unilingual Flanders court. It didn't exist. It started in Brussels, which was actually impossible to find subscriptions over there. In Brussels, the establishment, the attorneys spoke French. Everybody who tried to impose some Flemish ideas was seen as a dissident, needed to be removed, and so on. So what did they do? They moved the whole journal to Antwerp where they find some kind of group and that group would be establishment or would be responsible for the establishment of the next Flemish journals but also would be very much involved in legislation to Flemish law. This journal was not the best in its kind. Not at all. It's all it was poor. Um, what did they just do, for instance, is just copy case law from the Netherlands 
which had, which had another uh, another legal system, but it had the same language. But what can you do with a court or with a, a judgment from the court from the Hague? What can you do with that in Brussels? Nothing. It has no value. So basically, this journal was a nice idea. It lasted on, but I just wonder who would be very interested to read that, except for the fact that you're a Flam Flemish ideologist and you want to buy it out of support. Anyway, this brings me to my conclusion, because the aftermath is uh, only, or well, happens only during uh, the interval. What does this learn? And what did my research already learn is that journals respond to society. So they are just not just only looking to law and legal uh, changes, they really look to changes in society. For instance, Journal Stephen who has ideas on social law, which was not good or was, which was not bon ton at that time in the French speaking liberal elite. They responded to the uprise of workers' cause. But also important is that journals respond to each other. So, for instance, the which responds to Journal de Journal de who takes over the program of La Belgique Judiciaire, who is at that moment, in 1881, just a fossil. Just old, rarely, nothing happens anymore. The fire has gone. What do we see also is that general journals have a sort of emancipatory function. They always want to get relate to the people. The people have to be taught about law, the people have to be taught in Dutch about law, the people have to be involved in the whole legal system, otherwise you cannot work. That's something very strange. So it's not written as such for legal professionals. It doesn't mean that people will read it because sometimes they're just not interested. But it has a lot of finality. Specialist journals, on the other hand, are more survival of the fittest. They show how legal branches are established, but they also bring in new ideas, and those with the most best or best ideas, the, the, the best editors, for instance, can survive. The other ones are just ruled out. Most of the time you see a cluster of four or five journals working on the same topic, and then by the end of the generation you see only one survive. They also respond, in this case, to a Belgium that is looking for its legal identity. Belgium wanted to move away from France it wanted to move away from the idea that uh, it is a French colony. It wanted to introduce new legal ideas. It didn't succeed because until today we have the Napoleonic Codes. We are more French than France. But still, there was that idea that we have to change that. Another thing is that administrative law is important, not the constitution. That's really important because we always think, oh, the constitution is the basic idea of a country. Yes, it is. But still, if you don't have a good, proper administration, institution, nothing will work. So, once again, we need to reassess the importance of administrative law. Another thing is that this identity, legal identity, is just given by a small group of people. Attorneys in the 19th century were already a small group. I think there were maybe 500 in the whole of Belgium. And from those 500, only a small fraction was responsible for bringing ideas in law, bringing ideas to the people, and so on. Most of the time, they were French-speaking and liberal-oriented. So, freedom before everything. But in Flanders, we see another thing. We see more Catholic ideas. There we have to take care for each other, and so on. 
And another thing that's very important, which has not been researched before, is the role of civil servants in the whole bringing together of a national identity, a national legal identity. Most of the time, civil servants are lawyers. They have studied law, but they are not practicing it anymore. Another thing, civil servants are most of the time close to the people, more than attorneys who live in their cabinet and just have to deal with cases when it's already too late. Anyway, what I conclude as such is that they have only one goal. This was shaping Belgian law to a general one. With this strange twists and turns, but they tried to bring in new ideas in law. Sometimes they succeeded, sometimes not. Of course, if they didn't succeed, that was most of the time because of political matters and not because they didn't want to change. So this is now the end of my presentation. And if I'm here for questions, remarks, as well. Working class needs to work very hard, and we can 
bring in the profits. It wasn't very Catholic at that moment. But they knew that they had to get work together, the unionists, as they call it then, to promote themselves as, look, we can be one country, we work together, we have a common history, and what's the common history? For this is uh, the, the, the Battle of 1302, uh, where Flemish peasants won against the, the, French, uh, the French army. Okay, we always forget that the year after we were just annexed by France, but that's not, not important. Other things is that we look to important, uh, or they look to important legal philosophers, such as the Dalmoder, who is renowned for his Prateke uh, Criminele, so the, who even published it in Latin, but I don't know the Latin name now, but who is really well known in Europe. Um, there are other, uh, but their names escape me now at the moment, there are other philosophers, legal philosophers, to which they refer and say, look, th those are Belgians. They brought in, uh, 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 we, we had great legal thinkers in the past, so why would we have any great legal thinkers now? So we have this kind of legal culture already from a long time ago, even during the, the early modern period. So we are one country. We have one political idea. We don't want to be with France, we don't want to be with the Netherlands. We want to be independent. So, and that's how they referred to uh, their common history. Those are the, 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 the important thing. Another uh, example is the uh, Brabant Revolution, who was just after the French annexation, but well, just before the, the French annexation. So they also see it as a, a huge part where we always try to uh, be stubborn towards the, our oppressor. Even they also said uh, the, the first lines of La Belgique Chinciere is very clear, after we were ruled by the Spanish, the Austrians, the French, the Dutch, and so on, now we finally will do it ourselves. And all those guys, we have to kick them out. So it's really, it's really nationalist thinking. So, and, and that's, 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 ni hey, that's nice to read. Then you see, like, look, they even refer to Flemish things, really Flemish ideas, to just show that, look, we are one nation. We may speak French and we may speak Dutch, but we are one nation. We have the same history and so on. Mm. Yeah. But Joseph, which names did they select of this common past to say that they are Belgian? For example, Valkoning. Valkoning? Yeah, but Valkoning Valkoning? Is, is not a great legal thinker in their minds. Not, yeah. he, he, is important, he was important before that uh, because he even, I have to say, one could be Gimbom and the third one, um, in the Dutch era, they were in Belgium, working together, and there you see actually the segregation already. So, but I didn't read this here in, in, in general, but they didn't refer to Warkönig, but uh, the big little fingers. No, but I mean, what, when Warkönig is writing mm -hmm. about the history of the Belgian mm -hmm. nation, mm -hmm. he's writing in French, mm -hmm. for example, in the yes. Thémis periodicals, yes, 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 yes. I'm very fond yes. of the Thémis. Yeah. And he's writing. He's writing. Oh, the Belgian nation is great. We have such, you know, have such a, a long history of legal thinkers. And the legal thinkers, the names he select, are Hugo Grotius, uh, Vinius, yeah. uh, but, but Vinius was one of them. Vinius was one of them. Johannes Hood. No, not them. But, but the first we, we, is we mentioned. Yeah. One of, the, uh, of course, they were all. Yeah, but, but uh, that's were, the thing. That's the thing. Do you don't know what, which names do they select? Are, are they so careful about the Catholic no. background? Mm, no. No, no, no. So, so Phineas is, is also mentioned, but, but the most important ones are, are, are Wieland and then the Dampoder. And But I, I can check it, of course. I, I no, <laughs> but I don't know it by heart. Because they give a whole list of names, and, and they, they aren't just. Flemish, or they aren't just Wallonian, they are also <coughs> even Dutch yeah. sometimes. So it's just really a showing off. It's really like, voila, we have this um, kind of important legal thinkers, and so we, are, we have the right to be independent, also legally independent. Of course, you, 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 
you feel that there's some issue with that because they just randomly throw in some names. So, but it's also with the romanticization of, of the Battle of 1302. They, they make it very romantical as the, just uh, the, the, the Flemish people who were oppressed by the French and uh, they just uh, defeated the French army uh, in a swamp. It didn't completely go as the story says because the, the line of Flanders is uh, uh, um, the, one of the, the most important books at that time where the whole battle is described and it didn't go exactly as the, the book says. So some things were different. On the colonial part, um, what was the question there? Because we, the, the, thing, the thing was uh, on, on the colony, for instance, um, Picard was very nationalist. He believed that we had to be a strong country um, with its own colony because there was a lot of wealth in Belgium. And to maintain the wealth, colony was much needed, much wanted. Um, almost everybody supported that, that idea. Uh, until the moment the English, the British at the early 20th century said, that uh, the king was responsible for chopping off hands in the colony uh, for um, abusing a lot of uh, means over there. So, but then again, then you read in the Genoa Tribunal, for instance, it's all propaganda from the British. That's not true. It's just propaganda. And probably the, 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 the truth will be somewhere in between because the British wanted to have the colony too. And we won't say what they did in their colonies. But the thing is that, that you, you see a sort of extra nationalism on this colonial issue uh, where, where the civilization part is important, but also the, the large Belgium idea. Belgium is a big country. Although we are small, we even are able to have a, a colony which is 80 times the size of our country. And so we can we can manage that. So there's a real idea, like look what we can do. And, and it's really strange how how no one until 1958 or something, when everything is collapsing, everything every every lawyer even thinks that's a good thing over there. What happens? And chopping of hands that's just propaganda. That didn't happen. If you close your eyes, it doesn't happen at all. So no, but that's that's. Uh, it's really remarkable, and now we are doing research on that too, um, together with colleagues from Brussels who really are completely in the whole colonial law um, idea, and where they also see that, that uh, Belgian lawyers go to co uh, Congo, where they try to impose some Belgian legislation, but try to find a way with traditional law to get their, their way. So it's really, it's really interesting. Uh, I'm, I'm curious what will be the end result of that. So, okay. Other questions, remarks. Yes. It was really, really suggestive. Mm -hmm. So my first question has to do with the definition of journal. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And regarding that, I, I was wondering if um, is it possible to analyze or to, um, to see a kind of evolution regarding the content? So do they pay attention to doctrine and different authors? And in, is there a moment in which they uh, include um, jurisprudence, uh, commentaries on, on sentences or I don't know, maybe uh, some, uh, some special decisions or, mm -hmm. or different organs of, mm -hmm. the, of the state. So I don't know if it's possible to um, to, to check uh, a change, maybe not, mm -hmm. um, in the contents of the of the, of the different mm -hmm. journals. Mm, secondly, um, I have one question because I have. I don't know anything about this, um, this history of, of legal journals, but the fusion of journals. The, the distribution, I don't know how to say it. The uh, distribution. Distribution of yeah. journals. So, um, just to... Um, 
I was wondering if it was possible to, uh, or if you have studied, uh, if, for instance, it was compulsory to, to buy in, in the courts or in, in different, um, well, about voting in courts, if it was compulsory to have uh, some, some journals. Because that was very typical, mm -hmm. sometimes it was uh, compulsory to have <coughs> some different uh, publication in order to, to prove or, or not um, these channels of um, diffusion of ideas or ideas and uh, what kind of, of people or, or, or bodies or organization or institutions um, bought that kind of, um, mm -hmm. who, who read that, that those, those journals, mm -hmm. those legal journals? And it, I, I found um, thoroughly you know, quite interesting this, um, what you were um, telling us about the, the people involved in passion in promoting these journals. No? You, you have talked about uh, magistrates and uh, lawyers and also with civil servants. That was really, really impressive. And oh, finally, even politicians and so on. But I, ask uh, myself what, what happened with scholars. I mean, is there any relationship between university and legal, uh, legal journals? Which was the, the role of scholars um, regarding these legal journals? And finally, <coughs> one uh, reflection on, of course, <laughs> administrative law. Um, it was really very, very interesting, this, this, this element of, of administrative law and well, this, this idea of um, paying attention to some issues um, of administrative law and so on. And I don't know if, um, if following this idea of when administrative law starts to begin, begin being a content, a main content of these uh, journals, or even there are many journals devoted to administrative mm -hmm. law, if it's, if it's only a question of building a nation, mm -hmm. or if maybe um, there is a passage from building a nation to building a state. So I, I, I really don't know mm -hmm. if to what extent these uh, legal journals are useful uh, to to try to build and stay, or if they have no success, that would be also a, a good source to, to discover the possibility or not yes. to build and stay. But these uh, both components of um, the emergence of, of administrative law and also colonial law. Yeah. It's not a question of nation regarding mm -hmm. colonies, but mm -hmm. state regarding the colonies. So maybe uh, this could be a um, way of, um, of studying, and if we cannot talk about um, not builders, journal, uh, legal journals, mm -hmm. builders of, na of nations, but maybe something like from builders of nations, from states, builders of the state. Yeah. Um, thank you, thank you, Leo, for those questions. Um, on the definition of journals, for instance, um, definition, defining journals, um, to be honest, I don't do that a lot, because you can stick to one definition, and then you get stuck. Because there are, for instance, people who say you have to define a legal journal as a uh, by lawyers, for lawyers. But then you lose, for instance, Journal de Tribunal, La Belgique Judiciaire, the Rechtskundig the Rechtskundig but a lot of journals who are meant for the people. Because they write, of course, they write too for lawyers, but they write also for the people. And that's actually their main goal, em uh, emancipating the people. So defining them is rather, for me, pragmatic. I do it really pragmatic, and it's really strange how uh, legal practitioners have some sort of consent on each, each journal 
I, I talk to, they, they say, okay, yes, but isn't it considered as a law, a law review or law, legal periodicals, for instance, the, the Monetary Belgium? This is not it, because it's just the publication, the official publication of um, the, the legislation. This is not seen as a journal, although it appears in every day. Anyway, um, for the content evolution, yes, we see changes. We see changes in uh, the amount of doctrine uh, that's shrinking or getting taller. Also, the, the case law, for instance, and so on. The La Logique is a very striking, striking uh, example because as long as the, the editor in chief lives, it's very doctrinal, it's working on institutional history, it's really trying to find the nation, the, the state, for it to find the, the, the both ways. It even takes the effort to literally write down everything in what happens in the Assizes uh, Court. So literally all, uh, each sentence that has been written, that uh, has been said, has been written down. So you have extensive case law over there. But as soon as Bartels disappears, you see sudden change in case law. Why is that? The other editors have too much work and they just go uh, pick uh, low-hanging fruit. That's case law. It's really easy. They have good connections with uh, magistrates because they are attorneys, but they are also politicians and so on. So what do they do? They just say to their friends, hey, if you have interesting cases, just send them to us and we will publish them. And you see really from, uh, I would say, 30% case law, uh, 40% uh, uh, 30 doctrine, 40% case law, and then uh, the rest 30% uh, 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 disannals, uh, so uh, advertisements and, and other uh, news on the legal world. You see that case law really taking over and only being case law. So you see that La Vigie for instance, that's what I meant with fossilizing, it doesn't bring anything new anymore. It doesn't have an idea, it doesn't have it just publishes what's there. So it doesn't think, it doesn't add anymore anything to the, 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 the legal world. Journal Tribunal, for instance, never changes really in content. It's really uh, one, at least one doctrinal contribution, then three or four cases, and <coughs> and even in the early years, some. Uh, legal roman uh, romantic uh, stories, really about how courts can go and what's life as an attorney and so on. So, yes. 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 Journals, you see large elaborated legal doctrine. Really, uh, for instance, the Flanders Institute really publishes um, the explanation of the municipality law in a whole year. Really, the, the, the all issues are filled with one long article. If you bring them together, it's more than 100 pages just on the, the law of municipalities. Second year law of provinces, and so on. So every time there's a higher step, and, and you see the doctrine is really important there, and case law is less important, which is logical, because they only publish case law in Dutch, which was at that moment for Belgium almost non-existent. You only see Dutch case law appear from the 1930s on. Then, then it starts to appear, but before that it's, it's really Really marginal. If you're lucky, you can find one. Um, second question on distribution, dissemination. Difficult. Uh, in this way, so the readership, we don't know. And you probably cannot know. In this sense, what? You don't have the list of buyers no. at the end, never? No. no but that, that, that's the thing. For instance, uh, well, I don't know how, how it's. Uh, how they are preserved here in, in Spain, for instance. But in Belgium, we cut off, uh, cut off all the, the cover things, so we didn't have any information on contributors. We didn't have any information on the price. We didn't have any information on the content, so we literally have to 
go to all the issues to find what you think you might need. Uh, so, so it's really it's very usual to find not on a stage, yeah. very usual to find a list of buyers and yeah. you have the institutions, you have the prices and also the catalogs of the of the printing offices, yeah. the typographers, the and they have the catalogs of the typographers, the printers, yes. Yes. The printers, yeah. the, printers. Yeah. The, publishing houses, yes. the, the publishing houses, they have the catalogs have the list of mm. buyers. Least, yeah. Sometimes there are um, um, regulations yes. and what um, we'll say that this, um, this uh, institution, this course mm -hmm. must have or must buy and, yeah. and uh, once a year this publication. That, that's, that, that's what you see for, for uh, um, journals who are supported by the government. Uh, for instance, I, I talked about that one example uh, of, of uh, communal law that municipalities. Um, that was because he was good friends with the minister. It did work. It did help, of course. But the minister issued uh, a, a, a decree of which he imposed on all uh, municipalities, on all mayors or secretaries of mayors, to have a subscription on that journal. So that's where we know that every community in Belgium has at least had it. It's not not always preserved, but at least it was there. Um, what do I only know, for instance, from the journals itself is, oh, yay, we have 500,000 subscriptions. Oh, yay, we have 1,000 subscriptions, something like that. But nobody knows how many are messages, how many are attorneys, how many are just interested people. We don't know. We really don't know. And, and it's really strange also if you took, take catalogs from libraries, um, I think I was lucky to find one in the courtroom in Antwerp, in the court. And there you see they only had five, and at that moment there were 20 journals, but they only had five to subscribe to. So you can have an idea, but then again, we don't know. It would be interesting to have catalogs from attorneys, magistrates, and so on. But then again, you have one important thing. It's not because you have a subscription on it, you read it. That's not that's not the case. No always. Mm -hmm. For instance, we, what? No. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. But it's mm -hmm. way of, of course it's yeah, of course it's true. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well the, the the thing the uh, for instance uh, on I know two examples on uh, municipality law that was promoted by the government. And um, on um, uh, workers, uh, on industrial law, so uh, um, workers' accidents and so on. Mm -hmm. That was heavily promoted by the, the government, but otherwise, there was always private initiative. Mm -hmm. Really, it, it was, uh, and, and what was really striking, if you just read the whole history of Belgium, is that you have this kind of battle of egos where. Uh, the one cannot play with the other guys, so I will start my own journal. Actually, the, the Journal Tribunal, Edmond Picard, was not allowed to play anymore with La Belgique Judiciaire because he had written some very critical, some really, really nasty comments on uh, lawyers in Brussels. They were fat and doing nothing at all anymore, and so basically he was really tackling the whole legal... <laughs> legal, legal <laughs> yes, 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 no, that's the thing. He was really introducing legal <laughs> gossip. And so La Belgique said, you will never publish in, in our journal again. And then he said, you know what, I'll just on my own. Because we have, the, the, that was also important for Belgium. That was at that time, in the 19th century, the most liberal country for publishing. You could publish everything over there. Everything. It, you, you, you could insult uh, heads of state without being punished. So it's really, that wasn't seen before. Um, the third question on scholars and universities, <laughs> nothing really. Uh, I think the first journal connected to universities, for instance, is published in 64, 1964. And uh, it's really strange that, that legal scholars as such were not involved in, in the whole publishing thing. It's, it's really, there, there is no such thing as a pure scientific mm -hmm. 
law journal, and even if there is, it's not meant for that. We have uh, a very known uh, journal uh, on private law, and it always says we are the best scientific legal periodical in Belgium, and yes, they are, but there is no attorney who ever reads a scholarship in it. Never. Why would they? It's the most interesting part is the case law, which is <coughs> published in it, and which is bringing a nice summary of what's, what's the evolution in Belgian law. But the legal scholarship is really something, it's a niche in, 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 in what, until now, the, the Belgian thing. I think now, um, only Liège and Leuven have their own journal. Kent? No, I'm not even interested to start one because I asked it. But no, I'm not, not, not interested. And um, other, other faculties neither. So it's really, it's really strange. We, we don't know. Yeah, it's very particular. Uh, very particular. Um, the only thing you will see that legal scholars are getting important is in the 1980s when actually publishing houses uh, are trying to impose their journals on the market and they search for uh, professors at universities to be editors and so on and then you only see that they are connected to universities but they are not really related to the university so they always try the uh, publishing houses always try to get a few professors from different faculties together and in one board but again if they neglect to publish case law or other important things for legal world, nobody reads them. And that's that's really strange. And then and that's where the idea comes from. Actually you can have a nice theoretical approach, but if nobody applies them legal practice uh, as a legal practitioner, what's what's it worth? And if you look around the countries around us, uh, they have more scientific journals than we have. And it's really yeah, for me, it's, it's actually the battle of the egos who are, uh, who are opposing that. So. And the third one was the administrative law, building state or nation. Actually, you're right. <laughs> I should have said for the, the administrative law that's more building a state instead of a nation. Um, nation is indeed the idea of uh, we, 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 we are the people who are, have to be united in one territory and so on. But the administrative law is really already to build that state. So really the state institutions and so on. So how needs how needs a province to work, uh, how does the state work and so on and so on. So basically there is uh, an important remark that I have to change my title. Yes. Yeah, it is. Yes, 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 yes. It is. It's very important. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. 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 Y
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 